Um, so please join me to welcome Eileen Milka Smith. So uh, I think the next, um, well, I'm going to pour my heart out about Eugene Smith, and um, and then I hope at the end we can have Q and A and you know share um, the time together. So um, everything I'm going to talk about is either what um, Jean told me um, directly or what I experienced uh, being with Jean. Uh, I was with him a total of five years and. Um, it was during the last part of his uh, photographic career. Uh, so, uh, I, just starting with when he was born. He was born in 1918, December 30th, uh, in Wichita, Kansas. And uh, from a very young age, age 14, he was very interested in photography. And uh, he was growing up just, um, those teenage years were in, during the Great Depression and with the dust storms in Kansas. And uh, when he was in class um, and saw a dust storm coming and all the locusts landing, he would ask his teacher if he could leave the classroom and go and photograph, and the teacher would give him permission. Uh, so he started um, putting his photographs in the local newspaper. Uh, it's, um, the times were, of course, very hard, and um, his father um, committed suicide, and that was, of course, he was a teenager, very shocking to him. And uh, it was part of the reason it was the depression and the, the farm hands and not being able to pay farm hands and uh, and the reporting in the local paper that he had you know sent photographs into uh, uh, reported in a way that he felt was so ugly and so terrible that he went to his editor and he just said you know I hate journalism I don't want to do this and um, his editor um, said no it's not that journalism is bad. It's how it's done, and you know, it's important to do it well. So, um, you know, his passion for journalism was really great. And um, just before he, well, he, we, he turned 18, he wrote this letter to his mother that I'm going to um, read to you. And um, it's just before he leaves for New York, where he's going to start as a photographer. He said that he always told me, he said, he just took two purple shirts, because purple shirts, you can't tell the dirt on them, so it's very convenient. So this is what he wrote his mother, and by the way, his mother was a very, very strong woman and probably would have been a great photographer, but in those days and age, he was like being a mother, being a housewife, and so she actually followed him to New York, and she was like a, in Japanese you call it stage mama, which is like, you know, following around and, you know, Calling the editor and things like that. It's like, yeah. Um, I, there's Gina sent a photograph of her, and um, she had already passed when I met Gina, and she would have been a very, very scary mother. <laughs> <laughs> but his first wife had to deal with her during the war and living together with small kids. So, anyway. Um, so, this is what he writes his mother um, My station in life is to capture the action of life, the life of the world its humor, its tragedies. In other words, life as it is. He's 17 when he writes this, okay? A true picture, unposed and real. If I am shooting a beggar, I want the distress in his eyes. If a steel factory, I want the symbol of strength and power that is there. I want my pictures to be symbolic of something. I realize that this is a pitiful effort to explain my philosophy of photography but it is out of this haze that the fulfilling of my ambition will be. Long years are ahead, probably years of hardship, but what care I if I can succeed? So that is what he wrote when he was 17. And I walked into his loft when he was 51. And he had actually done that all through the years. He, he fought for photojournalism. He, he had um, first, um, he, he was photographing um, you know, daily, you know, one, one day assignments, half a day assignments, and then he uh, was uh, photographed the Pacific War, 13 invasions, and uh, was injured in Okinawa when he, he was 26. And after a long recovery, he um, went back to working for Life magazine. And so during the um, first half of the 1950s, he produced 
um, various famous essays, Country Doctor, Nurse Midwife, uh, Spanish Village, uh, Schweitzer, Af uh, Schweitzer in Africa. And, um, and then um, he had, um, he, he fought with his editors every time um, to get the story right. But finally, with the Schweitzer story, he resigned. So that was in 1954. And after that, he was freelance. He photographed in Pittsburgh for a year and um, issued those photographs. But after that, he hadn't been done doing any other major work. So in the 60s, in the 1960s, um, after going to Japan for one year and photographing Hitachi, the company Hitachi, he was pretty much inward and inside the loft and photographing from the loft and was more kind of in, inward. But he had fought that, you know, really fought that fight. And so when I walked into the loft, he was, that was in 1970, August. Uh, and I was 20 years old, he's 51. Uh, he was preparing, um, he was in the middle of preparing his uh, retrospective photo exhibition. Uh, it was going to be, a, we always called it a 600 print show. It was more than 500 prints and then um, close to 100 photographs of the, of the war photographs on slides on the wall. So 600 images. And um, <clears throat> so I walked into that preparation and for that he didn't have any money and it was very delayed and things were not going well. and. Um, he was very worried about meeting the deadline. There were a few people helping him. Um, everybody was in their early 20s. There were three main people in the loft. Um, and this was in um, New York. Um, it was um, it was 821 uh, West 6th Avenue. So it was between 28th and 29th Street in Manhattan. And um, how I met him was a summer job where um, a friend of mine couldn't do the job, so she, he said, well, I mean, you've never done this, but maybe you can do it. And it was being an interpreter, facilitator for an advertising company, Dentsu, and the client was Fuji Film. So I arrived there that hot summer day, and downstairs was a hardware store, and um, there was like um, black spray paint on the, on the glass door, and a homemade mailbox, also with spray paint. And the um, Dentsu and Fuji film people said, oh my gosh, we have the wrong place. And um, I didn't know anything about him, but I said, no, this is the right place. And we rang the bell and he came down. And um, I still remember that the, 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 the Dentsu people and the Fuji film people said, you know, it's such an honor to meet this famous photographer and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Then he turned to me and he said, did you ever hear me before today? And I said, no. And we kind of laughed together, and it was like immediately we were like, it was like the two of us sort of like, we, we just connected. Anyway, so um, the next few days um, we were photographing him. He was to say, Fuji color is beautiful, although he never took color photographs, but because he needed the $2,000 to, to complete the exhibition. So um, he always had integrity, but for, for finishing the exhibition, he took on this job. So, um, so uh, he basically, when we were photographing him, he was supposed to act serious and talking. So what he did is he poured his art out about journalism to me um, while being photographed, you know, for the commercial. And he just poured his heart out about journalism, integrity, and how important it was, and why, you know, the people are not, um, Objective. There's no such thing as objectivity. We're all. We all have carry our backgrounds. We all have, you know, everything that we've been born and grew up with, with us. And so, it, it essentially, he's saying that we're lying if we say we're subjective. You know, we're subjective, and journalists are subjective. So, what's the most important is to be as honest and as fair as possible. And then he also said that uh, the commitment for a journalist is to, to the, 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 those that you photograph and the viewers. And so by me, the meaning of the commitment to the, 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 those that the photograph is not to show them you know, nicely or whatever, but to show them exactly the way you saw it to your best ability. So a responsibility towards the, the subjects you, you photograph and to the viewer. And so all the um, essays that he had done that he was compiling for this exhibition um, were um, fought. They, he fought his editors. But um, because the editors was not, they, they weren't his responsibility. His responsibility
the lady was those, those two. Um, but then he took pride in the fact that if you really fight for your integrity and you know fight for what you, you feel is right and, and those two commitments, he was proud that he actually sold magazines and you know, actually did resonate. And in fact, she, actually he was able to deliver to Life magazine. So um, anyway, he just poured his ire about that. And um, at that time, um, he, it, he was working on the exhibition, but he was telling everybody that I'm going to kill myself when after the show goes, opens. And um, this was actually nothing new, because off and on, he'd been saying that sometimes over the decades, and people would get worried, et cetera. But it was quite serious. and. Um, uh, his partner of 10 years, Carol, had left him a year be and a half before that, so he was very, very depressed. And um, um, later I heard from Jim Hughes, who was the chief editor-in-chief of Camera 35, where we did our, our work in, on, on, on Minamata more extensively than in Life magazine. Um, uh, Jim said, you know, Gene would call so often about, I'm going to kill myself, that one time he said, well, then just go right ahead. <laughs> and, but of course, the next day, you know, Gene was alive, so um, he never really attempted it. Um, but, you know, his son would come down when, when his father would say that, but everything was always okay. Anyway, um, so I walk into this situation, and it's just the exhibition is really delayed. And I just felt, um, oh, I have to save the day, kind of, you know. And, and to feel like I have to save the day, I didn't know anything about what happened before. There were lots of people that walked into Gene's life and thought, oh my gosh, I have to save the day. You know, but I didn't know that, so anyway, I had to save the day. And um, I didn't even know that a 600 print exhibition was a large exhibition, but um, we started um, working together on it. And the whole place was just, um, every, it was like the extension of everybody's arm was like a camera. You know, it was just natural. It was just, you breathed the camera. And so he gave me the Fujikas that he had gotten from Fujifilm. And it was just within like a couple weeks or whatever, you know, I'm photographing just with like with everybody else. Um, and 100% of what I learned about photography, I learned from him. I know that for sure because I knew zero about photography when I walked into the loft. Um, and um, I just want to say that I think that he was a great teacher, and this was not just towards me, because when people would walk into the loft, and it was a friend of a friend, they would walk in and say, can I help? And he would just say, oh, we're spotting prints here. They were all original prints that had to be spotted, spotted, you know, for the exhibition. And he would just say, we're doing this here. Here's a spot, don't hear the brushes, you know, just work with everybody, bye, and go into the dark room. And so it wasn't like, you know, do you go to art school? Have you ever done this? You know, who are you anyway? <laughs> you know, kind of, there wasn't any of that. And I just feel like, you know, everybody grew because of that. Because suddenly, it's like, in about five, within five minutes of when you walk in, you're, you're responsible for this, this image, you know? So um, that's the way I learned, too. And um, I just feel like Jean's a great photographer, but I also feel he really was a great teacher. And I don't think people realize that. And um, I really feel like it's, it, I learned about one way of learn, teaching and learning. And that was that it was really strange, but um, there wasn't a single moment where I thought he was teaching me and I was learning, like I was a student or learning. That it never occurred to me. It was just that we were doing what had to be done. And so um, I got, I learned photography in a complete kind of topsy-turvy way because the first thing was doing, making master prints in the darkroom. So just making master prints, and I've n never been an artist or anything like that, but making master prints. And I saw him dodge and spot, uh, and you know, burn the print, dodge and print. It was in the dark room there on the second floor above the hardware store. And you just, you just, you're immersed in it, so you know exactly what went wrong with that sixth print that you tried to print, you know, the same image. You just, just knew exactly. And so it's like, okay, you, you put the next paper in, and I did that, and I knew exactly kind of what to do. And the first image I ever made was one of, one of the exhibition that I ever printed. And what I want to say is, it's not because I have talent. I wasn't an artist. I wasn't. I was. It just. It's just. It was being in that environment and working and feeling like committed that this has to happen, and it just happens. So it just happened. I, and. 
I, and I, so that I can't stress enough that I feel that Jean was a, a, a great teacher. And um, um, also, you know, because of his seriousness in journalism, everybody thinks he's just a very serious guy, which he wasn't at all. He's just joking around all the time and jumping around and dancing and, you know, all that all the time. And um, there were signs, you know, when he, when he got mad at something or when he thought of something, he would write a sign on the wall. He would just write on the wall. And so there were all these things written all over the wall, including being mad at the landlord, you know, this <laughs> for means you die or something, um, stuff like that. So, um, and um, during that time, um, he was, uh, right when I walked in, he was preparing um, the Schweitzer layout, and of course everything had to be made to size because we didn't have any copy machines. So each, the layout was 125 prints, and he was just passionately saying that he didn't. This didn't. He didn't. You didn't. It, it didn't work in Life magazine, and this was the final time I was going to do it. I'm going to do it right, and so he laid it out, and he would be, you know, continually talking about journalism, but always there was music, and he felt like. You know, it was music that was the most important. A lot of people felt like, well, you in, in, were you influenced by painters? And then he said, no, there's music. He actually carried records around during the war, from warship to warship, where he would then collect them again after another, another invasion, and he'd photograph, and he'd go back and collect his, and he just depended on that. And when he got injured after Okinawa, there were 20 operations he had to do. It was music. He listened to music all the time. It, it made him be able to survive. Um, and so that was, he was just passionately about that. So the dark room was, um, I know the movie starts with the jazz, the, the, you know, Johnny really likes that jazz, but uh, there was a lot of jazz. So there was like, it was like constant, it was like bodging and printing with Miles Davis in the background, with, um, you know, La Boheme, with, or like with Schweitzer laying it out, it would be La Boheme and he would be weeping and, and explaining and, you know, and dancing and, and saying, you cannot leave, you know, when, if you're out in LA, I will, I will be dead. That kind of, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, right, yeah, sort of like that. But um, so, um, uh, and the loft was this really, really old place where it, there had been many past lives there. You know, it used to be a, 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 a um, making clothes, manufacturing, you know, like, in the middle of town, right in the middle of town, almost a tenement situation, manufacturing, etc. It had, had many lives, and in the 1960s, it had been full of, of jazz musicians coming after hours to to go and, and do their the music that they really wanted to do from the middle of the night all the way through the night. And so he would say, "Yeah, the hole up here in the ceiling is because I was listening to the jazz upstairs, but." and recording it, but this saxophone, you couldn't quite hear it here, so I made a hole and put a mic up there and, <laughs> to pick it up. And so he had he'd done tons of recordings of, of jazz musicians, but it was like it was like a ghost place, that second floor, because you know, it had been like Thelonious Monk had been there because Hallow Woodin, who produced his music, had lived there. He, he was still there, but um, really um, very ill. But and then you know, Jimmy, there was a photograph of Jimi Hendrix playing the piano, the Genic photograph. But everybody was gone, right? It was like this quiet, silent um, place. And he would say, like, um, you know, the, the the place you're not supposed to live in, um, you know, this industrial place. And so when the inspector came, he said, I could still live there because the inspector said as he left, he's because he, everything is so messy. The inspector said as he as he left, well, you can't call this living, and then, and then left. So he was able to continue to live there. So that was the kind of place it was. And he even said that he liked cats that Brunhilde with his her, her cats. And one day she just went, said, meow, and just said, this place is no good, and just walked out with the cats, you know, things like that, he would say. Anyway, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the darkroom work. Um, because um, I know some of you are very interested in, in photography and darkroom. Um, the darkroom, the, the way, the, the, the movie does quite a good job of, of showing the darkroom. I mean, it's not the same as it was, the actual one. But um, uh, um, where he's printing and everything, it, it's really quite similar, kind of really surprisingly similar. Um, and, but, but there were three enlargers. Um, so there was a one for the 35 millimeter. 
Um, and by the way, he got fired for using a 35 millimeter camera when he was 18, working for Newsweek, because professional photographers would never use a 35 millimeter. It was like disgusting. You know, how could you do that? That's so amateur. But it was uh, for an operation, and he felt that it was needed. You know, small camera instead of this photographer walking in with a big camera. So anyway, anyway, so there was a 35 millimeter, you know, under 35, and then a four by five, and then there's this big, huge kind of wooden. Um, um, uh, in larger for eight by ten, for eight by ten, and um, he was doing all of them. But the four, four by five and the eight by ten was because he'd made some copy prints of the uh, copy negatives of the best image that he had. So we used some of those sometimes, but main, but mainly the thirty-five millimeter one. And um, so the printing was really like hands-on. I mean, I never, you know, there were tongs, tongs. Here, but just really didn't use time. You just stuck your hand in the belt, or you, you, you know, kind of. Um, and sometimes, if you realize that one part hadn't been burned in and off, you like this and try to keep it warm and you know develop it a little bit more, stuff like that. So then we put it in the hypo, and as soon as it was in the hypo, then he would just jump it around and dance around to the music and stuff like that. But um, and he did um, that. The printing was he had these makeshift um, like. Um, um, Sunday spoons, you know, where it's long and then it's like that, and he colored it black, sprayed it black, and so that would be for dodging or or stick with cellophane, cut out, just hand cut red cellophane there, and so that would be for dodging. So you you, you dodge, you try to get some areas of the negative where the the paper hits the white hits the paper, to not not get as much exposure. So you dodge like this, and then you burn in. The parts that um, like this you burn in the parts that are um, um, you need to have more exposure, and and so like in, in the I said in the movie it goes like still like this you you know you never still so like this you know and it's all calculated in the head to know you know how much to burn in how much to dodge and then you print and then it's like oh no not quite this not quite that so you do the same image again and he was really famous for saying you know how many prints he made and there was this sort of legend like a hundred hundred prints before he got the print he wanted i don't think he did that many for image it kind of escalates you know the kind of legend escalates but um but um, um uh so that was that was the way he printed and it was always always Claire mcgregor from scotch um, which he drank around the clock and always taking dexedrine and saying, I've taken some dexedrine, so I'm going to lie down and, you know, so when it picks up, and then like five hours later, he would finally get up. And then there would be, it was like constant all nighters, like every week was a bee about three all nighters. It just was sort of like that kind of round the clock. Um, so, um, and, you know, a lot of, because he had been so poor during Time After Life magazine, he had had really bad malnutrition, so his legs from his knee down were like, the skin was all discolored and very, very weak. So all during the time we were in Minamata, um, he had been um, battered um, uh, very, just before I met him, and so there was just no skin on part of his leg. And so all the time when we were in Minamata, he spent like you know an hour or more bandaging it before we could leave. So it was like, malnutrition was a problem and also because the out the, the, the war injury caused so much pain and he had trouble with his mouth because that's why he had needed to had so many operations because he had they had to reconstruct his mouth but there was still a hole on top of his palate so his dentures would just not fit and so he wasn't able to walk, um, eat very well so it was always just like orange juice and, and eggs all mixed up and that was that and the bottle of scotch a day was his basic calorie intake. Um, and so Clan McGregor was the cheapest, so that was that's what we got, and I thought, what are we gonna do when we go to Japan? But Suntory Red was the cheapest, so we got a bottle every day for that. But, um, so it was that kind of um, kind of um, life. But, uh, and, and also, you know, he always had, ended up t putting cameras in the pawn shops and then taking them out again, and then they were in again. So. But when I arrived, um, there weren't any in the, in the pawn shops. But because he had been photographing from a very young age, and he had stopped you know, being that public um, in the mid-50s, that when I would go to the camera store to buy you know, Dectol or whatever, 
um, he and I, you know, who 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 did you come work for? And I said Eugene Smith, and it's like the guy's still alive. You know, they had the image of him being like 90 years old when he was only 59. So, you know, um, so anyway, that was sort of what it was like. And then, um, and then we um, we um, uh, during that time is when we um, met. Um, but a gentleman from Japan came called Kazuhiko Motomura, and he came to the loft. And he said, I want to bring this exhibition to Japan when you've finished it and done it. And New York was going to show for three months in the Jewish Museum and then go to Japan. And so um, I want to take it to Japan. And when you, he knew that Gene had been in Japan before photographing Hitachi. They, Gene gave up that, that um, um, commercial company, that advertising company, that invited him and got him to come to photograph Hitachi. A lot of trouble because he was supposed to stay only a couple months. He ended up staying a year, and he would just be photographing fishing villages and you know farmers and the workers at Hitachi, and very little of the magnificent, magnificent um, factory. <laughs> but 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 it finally got into Life magazine as the Colossus of the Orient. And the people that I, I met afterwards, the Cosmo PR people, said it just saved our lives because we were we just were like the lost face totally with this guy, but then finally, you know, he came through with more than they ever had hoped for. Um, but anyway, so he had been in Japan before, you know, first interviewing Okinawa and then Hitachi. So Mr. Motomura came, and I think that he just had this ability, I think, to know Gene's, you know, like connection to Japan, also his, his, his passion for, you know, social justice, and also his, a lot of the images, the photo essays, were about you know medical issues or you know like country doctor or nurse midwife, and it, it it just like hearing about Minamata just brought everything together. Anyway, the moment we heard about Minamata, we decided to go, and it took us a year to get there, but the next year uh, we went. So, um, uh, and I think it was very much you know for me it was like I had been born in Japan, but I had lived in the states, and I wanted to go back to my. Home, you know, my homeland, and um, you know, it was sort of like what is happening to my my homeland, um, you know, as a result of rapid economic growth, right? So um, that's how we, it led us to Minamata. But I just I just want to say that, um, um, and and I didn't need to show photographs and go on and talk about more things. But for example, the the, the six hundred print show, um, when we it finally was time to put it up, it was like. It was like after you know many days of all nighters, and we we got there, and this guy, the oldest guy that worked with us, he was really old. I think he was twenty nine or thirty, almost even thirty. He was like really old. <laughs> Steve, he was so practical. He made all the frames. Every single frame was made to size. Actually, I was making you know mounts. So um, we arrived there, and he's going like Gene. You know, I mean Gene's dancing around and all this, and Dexter drinking alcohol and and all that. It's sort of like he said to me, look, we're the only two reasonable people in this whole group, you know. It's, we're gonna have to put up this exhibition, you know, so that's what he said. And all the layouts were made and everything that Gene had done there, but it was that kind of thing. And then Gene arrives, he, could, he can't walk anymore because he was in so much pain. He's in this big wooden wheelchair and magnificently, 500 prints, you know, he, he knew exactly in his head what had to be done. And, and the exhibition is the best form, it's, it's like his final form of photojournalism because it's not the confines of a page. You know, he always felt it's not the single print, it's the story, it's the flow, and it, the layout is like rhythm, like music, and he laid that whole thing out, you know, and it's so, so it, I just explained that because it's like the practical of us or the manager types of like us were thinking, work. And um, anyway, he knows exactly what he's doing. So um, that's that's how it happened there. I'm going to show some images um, of, of Gene's um, earlier work and then um, some images that he and I did in Minamata and, and talk some more along the way. Um, so if, if you could darken the room and... Um, Oh, and before I forget, um, Gene's archive is at the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson. And um, he was a real pack rat, so there's tons of stuff. Tons of three by five cards where he makes notes on, um, his war journals, his, so there's a lot of writing too, and a lot of stuff, a lot of things. And uh, 
and of course his, his photography. So uh, it's it's I think that place is if someone's anybody's interested in photojournalism and Gene Smith, you know, would be spending lots of time there. <laughs> okay, good talk on it. Um, so I'm just going to um, be showing you the images and then um, uh, maybe narrating a little bit. Uh, so um, if we could start on that, I'm sorry. Uh, well, first I want to do something completely different. This is Gene. Um, and I feel it really describes him. So you can see um, people forget because of his seriousness in photojournalism. I think this is very much seen. It was taken by a guy named Fuchigami-san in, in Minamata. And incidentally, I've, I've met a young person in Minamata, a high school student named Fuchigami-san. And that is a common name in Minamata, but I, I thought, you know, couldn't be related. And so I really got to know her, and she wants to tell the world about Minamata. And she's now in a foreign language school to, to learn English. And way much later, she said, my grandfather is Fuchigami-san, the guy that took this photograph. So, um, and, oops, okay, oops, Ooh, I don't know how to, okay. Do you want, do you want an advanced one? There, okay, so this is Jean's writing. So it says, dearest people, I love you all, I really do, this is, this was on a locker, you know, with all these, uh, dear people, I love you all, I really do, and that makes it all the more um, horrifying that I have dragged you into this excru excruciating situation made brutal by my own incompetence. And then it says, sincerely, the torture master of folly place. So <laughs> that's, that's Jean's writing. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, oh dear, I, I, I'm having trouble. Okay, the first four photographs are uh, World War II images. Oh dear, I'm not, maybe you should do it. I was gonna say, if you just tell me to advance, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that's better. Um, okay, the next image. And I just wanna read what he wrote. Um, to his family, he had two, two young children um, when he wrote this uh, to his wife and family in 1944 from the site from on September. Um, for these people, the pictures were my family within possibility, and I saw my daughter and my wife and my mother and my son reflected in the tortured faces of another race. Accident of birth, accident of home, Damn the rod of men that leads to wars. The bloody dying child I held momentarily in my arms while the life fluid seeped away and through my shirt and burned my heart into flaming hate. That child was my child. So um, he's in his early 20s or mid 20s. Next. Next. This photograph is called Paradise Garden. It was the first image he took after the war, and after um, you know the more than twenty operations. It's his son and his second daughter. Next. Okay, I didn't mention how beautiful the prints were, but um, the this print, the the best print of this image is like you know the most beautiful print I've ever seen. I mean, I feel it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, and um, yeah, uh, also um, later on I'll show you some Pittsburgh ones, but um, the Pittsburgh series, uh, this is done in the late um, 1957, 58. Um, that too, those series, I think that was the peak of his printing. They're just magnificent. 
and a guy named Jim Corrales, I've met him a couple times, but he, he did it with Gene. And um, so, you know, these, these long spots of various dedicated assistants or people who supported him. And so um, Gene and Jim just does, does a fantastic work on, 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 on printing. Um, and it was the best time with the silver still in the in the in the in the in the paper and, and the, in the, um, so the next um, couple of two images are country doctor uh, next yeah. uh, next so um, this was also a series where the editor tells him to get go come back many many telexes. And um, and um, telegrams and um, Gene refuses to say I still don't have the story. Next is uh, Welsh miners. This next one. Next. The next um, five images are Spanish village. Next four images are nurse and wife, Mark Allen. Next. Ku Klux Klan. Next. The next five images are more, I'm sorry, are Schweitzer in Africa. Series, I say.
next. This is um, Andrea Doria sinking in New York Harbor. And then the next seven images are Pittsburgh. Next. This, these next um, couple of prints are um, images are from the, um, his series of As from My um, uh, Window I Sometimes Glance. Next. These are all photographs he took out of his window. <coughs> he went down there with a doctor. Next, this is from him. This is his daughter. A series he did for Life magazine. My daughter, Nguyen Juanita. Next. that he took we were already, when he was in Japan in, the, in May, uh, 1961. Very touching. Next. 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 This is some um, hospital for a special surgery series. And then the last photograph, next. Okay, thank you. If you could make it light again, the room light again. Um, so, you know, I talked a lot about the beginning in New York loft and everything. Uh, I want to talk just a little bit about um, our life in Minamata. Um, so before I knew it, I'm sort of running out of time. But um, maybe, maybe if we darken the room again, I'll talk a few minutes about about it. Sorry about that. No um, okay. So um, the next is black and slide, I think, and then there's one of the shot of the movie. But if you go two slides over, yeah. So this is just the movie Minamata in our book. Um, our book, Minamata, was the um, sort of the, um, I know the Japanese word, Gema, was it? It's based on the book, Minamata. Yeah. Okay, um, next. So this is Jean and I in, in, in Minamata, and uh, we were there for three years. And um, uh, next, just want to show you a little bit about how we work. This was our house. If you could just do like six seconds and then move it on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is our house. Um, this is our landlady, this was our house, when, and we worked out of here, um, and this is, um, this is the room where we lived in, and um, this is the same room um, we had rented from um, somebody who, who, the family had lost this child, Toyoko, Toyoko right there, um, and 
this was our, 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 our where we developed the film, and we hung up the, the tomoko negative up on the, on the clothespin there. Um, the tomoko in the back, which is downstairs. You can see the image. And I think all three of us together, the, the ones that are together, I'm kind of scowling, but anyway, you can see. <laughs> Next. Yeah, I can see that I'm the scary person, you know. So. <laughs> Next. So this really portrays Team too. It's all out of focus, but I just love this photograph because this is how he related to kids, like we saw earlier. Next. This was our darker we got um, after about uh, maybe a year. And so we did all the printing here in this dark room. Next. And this is the outside. I don't, we don't have any pictures of the inside. Uh, Takeshi Ishikawa, who became, who was uh, assisted us. Uh, for, he was there about a third, almost half the time we were there. So he took these photographs, and you know we hardly paid him. It's like we we did some, but um, the way he ended up in Minamata was he helped us take our bags onto the train, and then Jun said, "said you should just come now too." He was inside the train, and before they were talking about what really, really, and then the door closed, and he said, "That's how my life started in Minamata." <laughs> The door closed, and Jean had said, "Don't worry, you have a place to stay." And we arrived. And we had only money for one futon, and so there's a single futon, and three of us slept on the first night. So after Jean says, "Don't worry, you have a place to stay," so that was sort of what I was like, "Okay, next. This is our dark room in Minamata." Next, and that's um, Jean with the family Tomoko, um, and her mother in the center there, and the whole family. So I think many of you have seen the Minamata prints or images. I think um, I, I, I sort of want to open it up more to discussion. But should I show, show some, or um, I can show some after you know during the question and answer period, maybe? Um, would that make sense? Okay. Um, so um, maybe if you can make it light, and I and and, and um, I can um, talk a little bit, a couple minutes more. So uh, the, um, the the tomoko in the bath image that we photographed, um, 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 and that's downstairs, um, as as was mentioned in the introduction, um, that uh, we did not, I haven't released it for the last twenty three years, and um, it was because. Uh, uh, during the, uh, well, Jean passed away in 1978 in, um, in, in October. And um, but Tomoko had died the year before, in 1977. And so the photograph was continued to go out into the world um, that Tomoko had died. And more and more it felt like um, kind of a rote thing. People would ask for the image, almost like they asked for the image, like if we got the image and we put it in, in, in our magazine or whatever in print, we've kind of done our job in, in telling the world about this, and you know, um, and almost like also we've done our job in, in, in working to stop pollution, kind of. And, and I just felt more and more like Tomoko was carrying such a burden, and I was like getting it out, getting it out, like forcing it out, forcing it out. And about that time, um, the family came to me and said, we want to re have let Tomoko rest. And I really wrestled with that. But the conclusion was that, you know, that, um, you know, she'd been going out in the world um, th this long, and, uh, and we wanted to let her rest. Uh, and that if I continued to send it out, it would be like a, a kind of a travesty because they, they did, did not, you know, they, they wanted her to be able to rest, and yet I was sending it out to people, and people were very moved by it, but not knowing what the family felt. And uh, I, I do not consider this like a statement about what photojournalists should do, but it was, it was, it was our situation, and so um, I chose to do it, and I could talk more uh, in detail about that decision. But now, um, with the age of the internet, it's completely been turned on its head because the images are going out like, you know, legally on like Wikipedia, 
and yet those that ask me for permission, I say no to. So I address this, I've been addressing this with the family, but the feeling is still of, 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 of not changing the situation, changing this. During all of this, the two decades, uh, the other children grew up and in Japan, and all, during all that kind of time, it's, it just was a lot of pressure on the family if you have, with it going out, like with you know, the burden of living in that town and, and having a, 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 a older sister with Minamata disease, you know, concern about marriage possibilities of all sorts of things. And, but now, you know, the activist who lives there is telling me like, they've now all grown up and their kids are also growing up and um, you know, it's 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 um, you've done what you had to do. So anyway, it's a continuing situation, but I, I allow it to be released in the movie because um, I felt the movie was made. It was a complete copy kind of made, and and of course, although it's very beautifully presented in the movie, if the real image wasn't inside uh, in the movie, it would be like the the. The, two act, the, the image that was portrayed in the movie would become the real thing and the, the, the two would be erased. And so um, I decided that it should be in the movie, so it is in the movie. Yeah. Um, um, the time has flown more than I thought, but I want to have a chance to be able to have an exchange of questions.